Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I am really excited to be here. This is a, it's a wonderful opportunity. And uh, I think we've, we've all gotten used to uh, the new reality of, uh, of learning distance and having conferences and, uh, and you may Yoon uh, from a distance. So um, I, I welcome you here to, uh, to the, um, the YCT uh, Shirin this year. Uh, I want to start with, um, I'm going to jump right in. Um, first of all, with a thanks to, um, to my hosts here, and also a thanks to, uh, to uh, Rabbi Helfgott for pulling this together. Um, it's, a, it's a huge undertaking um, and under really extraordinary circumstances, call a um, I, I'm, I'm going to jump in with, with a question. Uh, it's a question that's been bothering me for many, many, many years. Um, I've come up with many answers over the years that I did not like um, because I just thought that they were contrived. Um, this year, I came up with um, with something that I believe um, I believe holds um, a very powerful truth to it. The question uh, really takes us to Parashat Pinchas. Uh, for those of you who are sitting with the Tanakh, that, that's great. Um, if you have the source sheets in front of you that uh, that were made available, that's that, that's also wonderful. Um, I'm gonna so I'm gonna start with Parashat Pinchas, uh, Sefer Ben Midbar Sinai, Perek Kavchet. Um, it, it is it, um, is a section of the Torah that we should uh, many of us are familiar with because we read it quite frequently, every Rosh Chodesh. Um, we read uh, we read this this section. Um, we read it on every one of the Chagim. It is the section that that outlines all the different korbanot musaf that we have throughout the course of the year. Perek Kavchet and Perek Kavtet of uh, of Parashat Pinchas. We cover the entire thing. So every Rosh Chodesh we read the, the beginning of it, um, and then on each of the Chagim we end up reading the entire um, the, the entire thing. The question that I've been struggling with for decades, really for decades, is why is this here? Why is this in Sefer Bamidbar Sinai? This Sefer Bamidbar is not the place for Karbanot. Karbanot belong in Sefer Vayikra, at least that's my understanding. So why is the, the central section that talks about um, korbanot for the Chagim. Why is it? Um, why is it here in in the Sefer B'midbar Sinai? And that's that's the question that um, that uh, that I, I start with. Um, it, 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 look, when I come back to this question towards the end of this shiur, it's going to take us a while, um, and we have to uh, lay lay a number of foundations. And I'm going to go back. The bulk of our shiur is going to focus on Sefer Shmot, in particular, the second half of Sefer Shmot. Sefer Shmot essentially breaks down into um, into two different um, two different sections. The first section of Sefer Shmot focuses on Yitziat Mitzrayim. The second section of Sefer Shmot focuses on um, the emerging relationship between Hashem and Am Yisrael. So th that second, second, uh, se second section of Sefer Shmot really begins with Shmot Perek Yutet, B'nai Yisrael arrive at Har Sinai, continues on through, uh, through Matan Torah and, and the story of the Mishkan. Um, I'm not going to read through all the sources together with you, but we will refer to them. Um, the Ramban, that you have in front of you, would, as I believe the first source, Ramban has a, a, an extraordinary way of expressing what the function of the Mishkan was supposed to have been. Okay, and I'm, I'm just going to read through a number of select portions over here in the Ramban, um, but the Ramban essentially says that, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll read it and, and we'll, we'll discuss it out loud. Kasher diber Hasherem Yisrael. This is the, right in the very beginning, the first of the sources. Kasher diber Hashem and Yisrael panim b'fanim aseret hadibrot, that after God had shared aseret hadibrot with Yisrael in a very intimate way, panim b'fanim, me'ata 
Hinehem lo la'am, v'hu lahem le'lokim. They are his people and he is their God, exactly as he envisioned, right? Came to them at the beginning of Perak Yutet and Sefer Shmot and said, um, Atem tiyuli am segula mikol ha'amim, um, and a special relationship between Hashem and Am Yisrael. And because there's a special relationship between Hashem and Am Yisrael, um, you want a place, or it's befitting that there be a place to, uh, to develop this relationship. V'hinei heim kedoshim. V'nei Yisrael are, are sanctified. Re'uyim she'ye bahem mikdash v'ashrot shechina to b'neihem. It's only appropriate that there be a mikdash for God's presence to dwell amongst them. That's why the very first thing that Hashem instructs us about is the Mishkan. That there be a building in their midst and turns out in their center that is dedicated to God. It's in that house that God will speak with Moshe and God will um, will command Moshe about what need, needs to be commanded to B'nai Yisrael. Which Excuse me, God, sorry, for, uh, sorry for interrupting. Um, we never got any source sheets from the yeshiva to send out. Oh. Um, so if you, have a, if you have like a link or something that we can post in the chat so that people can access it. Um, let me, see. you know, I, I, I don't have one accessible to me, right? I, I, and I don't want to spend the time. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so um, afterwards, I will try to make sure that it's available. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, and I, will, I will tell you where my psukim that we're going to be referencing. If you have a Tanakh in front of you, it'll be easier for you to follow. And I'll, I'll try to make accommodations for that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I was under the impression that the source sheets were, were re- readily available. Um, okay, uh, so Ramban basically um, is building off of a, um, of, of a reading of the Chumash that's very straightforward. The end of Parashat Mishpatim, Hashem tells Moshe to come up the mountain. He doesn't tell him what it's for, except for to receive the Ruchot. He doesn't tell him how long it's going to be for. Moshe goes up the mountain, and then the very next pasuk after Moshe goes up the mountain is the beginning of Parashat Truma, where Hashem teaches Moshe about the Mishkan. And the Ramban's assumption is therefore what God is teaching Moshe on the mountain is how to build the Mishkan, how to build and operate the Mishkan. So, and, and that's where the Ramban is coming from in terms of outlining this perspective, he says, of course it makes sense that the Mishkan is the first thing, because you just established a covenantal relationship with Hashem, and now you need a place to continue that dialogue that started on Har Sinai. One of the things Ramban says in his continuation is that the Mishkan was really meant to be a portable Har Sinai. It's a private version. Har Sinai is very public. Um, the, Mishna, the Mishkan is going to be very tzanua. Um, but it's a, it's a private place where there's going to be a continuing conversation between God and B'nai Yisrael via Moshe. So the, the covenantal relationship that was begun um, can, uh, can continue. So that reading um, comes out of a very straightforward reading of, of the Chumash, uh, where immediately after Har Sinai, the first thing we, we really hear about is, is, uh, is, is the, the Mishkan. And that's great. That's great. And we're told what the function of the Mishkan is. Um, thank you for putting this up. Um, the, the function of the Mishkan. Okay. All right. I'm, 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 I'm just going to continue. Thank you. Uh, the function of the Mishkan. Um, Torah says it very clearly in the beginning of Parashat Mishpatim. V'yasuli mikdash. V'shachanti. Um, that uh, you make for me a mikdash and I will dwell amongst you. Hashem wants to live amongst Am Yisrael. Uh, and there's one particular vessel within the Mishkan that was supposed to have served as 
the, the actual meeting place where Moshe receives his conversations, that's the Aron. And the Torah says, again, in the beginning of Parashat Truma, um, that um, after Moshe finishes installing the Aron, um, I will meet with you there. This is a Perek Pasuk Kafet in Sefer Shemot. I will meet with you there. That is the place where the conversation continues. That, that is where I will speak with you um, from. So the, the opening of the story of the Mishkan sort of confirms Ramban's perspective over here. Um, this, is the, this is the place for the continuing of the discussion between Hashem and B'nai Yisrael. Um, all this is fine until we get to Perek Lamed Beit. Perek Lamed Beit of Sefer Shmot is the story of the Egel. And the story of the Egel takes all of this and, um, and creates um, creates a challenge. I'm not going to review a lot of, of the story of the Egel over here. We, we were, I assume that we're all more or less familiar with it. Hashem threatens to destroy Am Yisrael. And in the process of threatening to destroy Am Yisrael, he's going to start again with Moshe, which, by the way, is not an idle threat. He did that once before. He got rid of the world and started again with Noah. So now what he did on a global scale, now he's going to do on a national scale, right? He's going to get rid of Am Yisrael and start again with one of, right? The one that he thinks he can trust from, uh, from within Am Yisrael. He's going to start again with Moshe. As opposed to Noah, Moshe negotiates with Hashem, and in the end, the degree is affirmed. Okay. Uh, now, when we read the story of the Egel, um, and, and we're, we're all sort of familiar with this, um, Hashem says, okay, I'm not going to destroy them. By Yinachim Hashem, Hashem says, okay, I'm not going to destroy them. There's something funny that ha happens after Hashem says he's not going to destroy them. Moshe, he comes down the mountain, he deals with B'nai Yisrael, but then he goes back up the mountain. I mean, he goes back up the mountain, he tells B'nai Yisrael, I have to go up and... Um, I have to go back and I have to do kapara for your sin. And it's not clear to us what Moshe is going to be doing up there on the mountain. Hashem already said he's not going to destroy the people. So what's left for Moshe to do? Why does he have to go back up the mountain again? What kind of additional kapara is going to be necessary here? Well, when we read a little bit further, and we're going to spend a, a good chunk of time focusing on Perek Lamed Gimel. For those of you who have your, um, your Tanachim handy, um, Perek Lamed Gimel, and uh, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to read through pieces of this. We're going to go through it a little bit slowly. Um, there is where some of the issues that Moshe has to deal with begin, begin to emerge. And I'm going to start with the very beginning of Perek Lamed Gimel. I see it's up here on the screen. By the Ber Hashem Moshe, Hashem turns to Moshe. This is after Moshe had gone back up the mountain, right, and told him, uh, I'm not going to destroy them, and, you know, I'm not wiping anybody out. Don't worry. By the Ber Hashem Moshe, Lech Aleyizem. This is Perek Lamed Gimel Pasuk Aleyizem. Time for you to leave. Atav Ha'am Asher Ha'elita Me'eretz Mitzrayim. To you together with the people that you took out of this life. And I want you to bring them to the land that I promised that I'm going to give them. I will send some kind of angel or messenger in front of you. That malach will help you conquer all the nations who are there. Right? Um, and then when we go down a little bit further, um, Pasuk Gimel. Yes. Pasuk Gimel, you're going to go to Erezabat Halavudvash. You're going to exactly the place that was promised all, all along. However, Lo I am not going to come into your midst. Ki am 
You're a stubborn people. Ten achil samba darechane will consume you on the way. Here we get, begin to get a picture of what the challenge that Moshe faced was. Hashem said he's not going to destroy the people. Okay. He tells Moshe, I want you to take them to, to, to Eretz Yisrael, take them to the promised land, but I'm not going with you. I'm staying behind. I'll send along one of my guys. He'll take care of you. And what this does is it raises the question of, okay, Hashem's not going to destroy Am Yisrael, but what's going to be the nature of the relationship between Hashem and Am Yisrael? You know, the mashal that I heard many, many years ago from Rav Aaron Lichtenstein was, um, was the mashal of, um, of a young couple who just, who fell in love and they got married and on the wedding night, right, the husband goes out to buy a bottle of champagne and comes back and finds his wife in bed with the bellboy. He says, I'm going to kill you. And she pleads with him and she says, no, 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 don't kill. He says, okay, I'm not going to kill you. So the bellboy runs out. But what kind of marriage is this going to be? And that's the crisis that Moshe faces now. What kind of marriage between Hashem and Am Yisrael, what kind of relationship between Hashem and Am Yisrael is, uh, are we talking about? Hashem is not going to destroy them. But what, what, what's going to happen with the Mishkan? Is there going to be a Mishkan? Is the Mishkan going to serve as a place from which, um, a, a, where the relationship between Hashem and Yisrael is going to be developed and nurtured? Um, is the Mishkan going to be a place where Hashem is going to continue um, his conversation with B'nai Yisrael? Is there going to be a continued con conversation? Is there going to be a Mishkan? Or is this divorce? And Moshe doesn't know. In fact, if we go back a little bit to the to Pasuk Aleph of this parak, just right, if we can scroll that back up, thank you. For the very first Pasuk, uh, there's a line in here that's very, very powerful. Hashem tells Moshe, Lecha Leiza, I want you to leave here. Ata the Ha'am Asher Ha'elita Me Eretz Mitzrayim. You with the people, you took them out of Egypt. Hashem is telling him, you took them out, you deal with them, that's your problem. Now, that's not the first time this line appeared. This line first appeared when Hashem first spoke to Moshe when there was a problem. Hashem tells him, um, in, in Perek Lamed Beit, Pasuk Yud, um, Pasuk Yud, or more earlier, Perek Lamed Beit, Pasuk Zayin, Hashem tells Moshe, Lech Reid, I want you to go down, Shem tells him, your people, you took them out of Egypt. What's Moshe's response? Moshe's response comes in Pasuk Yud Aleph. Then know they your people. Asher Tamir, you took him out of Mitzrayim, not me. There's a tension over here, right? This, this is sort of like the reverse of what sometimes happens. You know, you, your wife gets or your husband gets a call from school um, that the, the kid messed up. And when you come home, right, your spouse, you, you, you turn to your spouse and says, you know what your kid did today? Right? So this is the biblical version of it. Hashem turns to Moshe and says, they're your people. You took them out of Mitzrayim. You go deal with them. Moshe turns back to Hashem and says, no, they're your, they're, they're your people. And there's a real tension over here. And we'll see a little bit later that I'm not just superimposing this. Moshe is actually using the same words that Hashem is using, but flipping them around. And it's going to come back to haunt us again and again. So that started with Moshe up there on the mountain. Little does Moshe realize how deep this runs. Because even after Hashem said, fine, I won't kill them, Hashem right? Hashem repeats that again in the beginning of Parak Lamed Gimel. And he says, Atav ha'am Hashem ha'elita me'eretz Mitzrayim. 
right here we get a, a sense of, um, of the magnitude of the crisis that Moshe faces. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time looking at the next little piece, Perak Lamed Gimel, starting with Pasuk Zayin. It's an extraordinary piece, and if anybody out there is a film director, I would love, I would really love to choreograph this and film this piece. It's just extraordinary. Pasuk, Pasuk Zayin continues this kind of, continues the story. Moshe would take the tent. And he pitched this tent outside the camp. Now, what tent are we talking about? This is not the Mishkan. This is some other tent that Moshe is pitching outside the camp. But not only is it outside the camp, it's far away from the camp. Harcheik min hamachane. So there's a tent that's being set up outside the camp, far away from the camp. Vikaralo Ohel Moed. Moshe called that tent the Ohel Moed. Vayakol mevakesh Hashem mitzel Ohel Moed Hashem mikhutz lamachane. And again, the Torah emphasizes if anybody wanted to meet God, whatever that meant, or to have a conversation, he had to go to the Ohel Moed, which is Michus Lamachane. The, the power, it, it's hard to describe the power of this in contrast to the Asuli Mikdash Veshachanti Betocham. The plan was for Hashem to dwell in the midst of all of Am Yisrael. But instead, what has happened is Hashem is not dwelling in the midst of Am Yisrael. Hashem has private meetings with Moshe very, very far away from where the people are. Hashem is making a powerful statement over here that he wants nothing to do with Am Yisrael anymore. He's willing to speak with Moshe, but he's not willing to have anything to do with Am Yisrael. The scene as it unfolds over here is extraordinary. Moshe el ha'ohel, and Moshe would go out, and again, that's being emphasized, he had to go out. When Moshe would go out to that ohel, to that tent, Yakumu Kola'am, everybody would stand, Vinitzvu, and they stood erect, Ish Petacholo, everybody right in front of their own tents. Vihibitu Achare Moshe Agba Oha Just imagine the scene where you're standing over here and you're in the camp and you see Moshe walking out. There's somebody who has a relationship with God, and you watch them as if you wish that could be you. And they watch Moshe and they follow him. And there is this silence as there are tens of thousands of eyes following Moshe. As Moshe walks through the camp and then walks out of the camp and people are following his eyes, following him into a distance, but really a distance, as he goes to the Ohel Moed. It, it's hard to imagine what could be more painful than to feel like God has rejected me? To feel like God has rejected us? To feel like the avenues of communication between ourselves and God have been shut down? Like, you go to make that call, and the operator says, I'm sorry, your call is rejected. But that's exactly what's being described over here. There's only one person in that camp who has connection with God, and everybody else is distanced. Moshe comes to the tent, the cloud comes down, people bow down. They're thankful that there's one person at least who has a connection with Hashem. But that's it. Hashem is not in the camp anymore. The whole concept of the Mishkan has been shattered. The whole concept of Hashem having a relationship with Am Yisrael has been shattered. The whole concept of there being, being a continued communication between Hashem and Yisrael no longer exists. And that, that's the scene that the Torah leaves us with as Moshe has to begin to contemplate what his next step is. The next step involves a series of discussions. 
they are discussions that are very, very complex. And um, they are so complex, you're not going to find any two parshamim that agree as to exactly what Moshe is asking for, what he's looking for. But again, I, I, I'd like to take a look very briefly at, at a number of pieces here that sort of highlight the, um, it, what Moshe is, is struggling with. If we continue on in the same parak, um, Moshe starts by turning to Hashem and says, look, you told me to go, but you didn't give me enough information. I'd like to take a look at Pasuk Yud Gimel. We have it, I think we have it up on the screen over here. Biata, im namatsati chen be'inecha, if I truly find favor in your eyes, which Moshe had, had referred to earlier, and Hashem said, you you find favor in my eyes. So if I truly find favor in your eyes, and I'm not going to talk about what that means. I'm not going to talk about that. But look at the last five words in this pasuk. I want you to acknowledge that this nation is yours. Hashem kept telling Moshe that your people, you took them out of Mitzrayim, you deal with them. Moshe turns back and says, I want you to acknowledge that this is your nation. God says something obtuse in response in Pasuk Yudalit, and, in, uh, and then when we get to Pasuk Tetzayim, Pasuk 16, Moshe reiterates his request. How will it be clear? How will it be clear to you, Hashem? How will it be clear to anyone that I find favor in your eyes, not just Ani, the Amecha? God, I want you to make a public statement. I'd like you to make a sign, a public sign that that these people are indeed still an Am Sugula. What Moshe is fighting for is not forgiveness. He's, he's fighting to start all over again. Can we have this relationship or not? Since it's only going to happen, nobody will ever know that you really um, are with us. We are an Am Sugula and you are our God. Halo belichtecha imanu. It's only if you go with us. That's the only way it's going to become clear. Hashem's response is still a little bit fuzzy. It's not clear. But what happens afterwards is really amazing. Hashem tells Moshe, after another round of discussions, Hashem tells Moshe, look, you and I, let's talk about this privately. I want you to go up in the mountain. The Luchot were broken. Let's replace the Luchot. You make them, I'll write them. Moshe, you go up in the mount. This, but this, this time it's going to be private. Nobody else, nobody's going to see, nobody's going to, be, no, nobody's going to hear. This is not about the rest of Am Yisrael. This is about you. You and me. You're going to find a private place on that mountain. I want you to go to that private place and, and you and I, Thing in this private place. Just, just to highlight how private this is, if you take a look at Perak Lama Dalid, Perak Lama Dalid, Hashem speaks to Moshe, and uh, many of us are familiar with this. This is part of the, part of the Torah reading for, uh, for fast days. If we take a look, everything that Hashem says highlights that it's Moshe and only Moshe. Right? We have Perak Lamadalit up here on the screen. Here's the first Pasuk. Psol Lecha. For you. You do it. All right. You carve the stones. Next Pasuk. You be ready. In preparation from the original Matan Torah, it's Hayu Nechonim. They have to be ready. The entire nation has to be ready. But the entire nation is not part of this, this scene. This is a private scene between Hashem and Moshe. 
V'alita v'aboker, you, singular. V'nitzav tali, you, wait for me there. V'ish, next pasuk, V'ish lo ya'alei imach, nobody else goes with you. Gam ish al yirah, nobody should even be seen on the entire mountain. It's just you. Pasuk Dalit, four verbs, four actions, every single one of them is Moshe. Vayifso, vayashken, vayaal, vayikach. This is all Moshe. Whatever is happening here on Har Sinai with the second Luchot is private between Hashem and Moshe. If there's any question about this, let's just scroll down a little bit further. This is where Moshe hears the Yud Gimel Midot, right? And we read this on fast days and we celebrate this as the relationship between Hashem and Am Yisrael has been restored. But when you read it in context, it actually turns out that the Torah is saying the reverse. Take a look at Pasuk Tet, which is up here on your screen now. Vayomer, this is after Hashem teaches in the Yud Gimel Midot the 13 attributes of mercy. Vayomer, his Moshe turning back to Hashem. And again, he starts with, If indeed I found favor in your eyes, which is the same language he used earlier to plead with Hashem to return to the middle of the camp. He says, Please, Hashem Please walk amongst us. Which means that Whatever Hashem told him beforehand, this was not included. And now Moshe is still pleading for Hashem to join the people in their march. Pasuk Yud is, for me, one of the scariest pasukim in the entire Torah. Let's read it, read it carefully. Not the way we read it on fast days, but the way we read it in the context of the story. Vayomer, here's Hashem's response. Yes, I will establish a new covenant. I am going to do lots of wonders for your nation. Moshe has been begging Hashem to acknowledge that they're his nation. And Hashem won't let those words out of his lips. He says, your nation. I will do wondrous things for your people. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. I'm going to do wondrous things for your people. But they're not my people. The last part of this pasuk drives this point home in ways that couldn't be more blatant. The nation in whose midst you dwell, are going to see the wondrous things that God does. What do you mean, the nation in which you dwell, Moshe? Who does not dwell amongst that nation? What happened to Basuli Mikdash Vishachanti Betocham? And Hashem has replaced his presence with the people with Moshe's presence amongst the people. And what it looks like, the, all the language that's expressed over here afterwards is all personal language of Moshe. Hashem is going to renew the covenant, but this covenant is being renewed with Moshe. If Moshe chooses to share that covenant with his people, then that's Moshe's problem. But it's not God's issue. God is not establishing a new covenant with the people. God is establishing a new covenant with Moshe. It's a private thing, a private relationship. This is terrifying. When, when we go a little bit further, I'm just going to point out one or two other references that demonstrate just how terrifying this is. Let's jump for a minute to Pasuk Kav Zayin. Pasuk Kav Zayin gives us 
a hint, a hint for what could be, but what doesn't exist yet. Hashem turns to Moshe and says, You, it's for yourself, I want you to write these things. This is private still. Because based on these things, I have established a covenant with you. Oh, oh, oh yes, and Ve'et Yisrael. There's a possibility there's, that, that's being dangled over here that, that this covenant could apply to the rest of Yisrael. But if it does apply to the rest of Yisrael, it's only going to be through Moshe's agency. It's only going to be through Moshe's mediation. God is not going to have a direct covenant with Am Yisrael. God is going to only have a covenant with Moshe. What happens here, and from here until basically just about the very end of Sefer Shmot, is we have a meticulous retelling of, um, of the story of the building of the Mishkan, not of the plan for building the Mishkan, but of the actual construction of the Mishkan. Um, in the process of the retelling, there are a number of little details that often get overlooked. I'd like to share with you some of those details. Here's one. When Hashem tells Moshe to build the Mishkan, the purpose of the Mishkan is very clearly stated. Yasuli Mikdash, Veshachati, Vetocham. That purpose is missing from Vayakhel and Pekudei, where the Torah describes the actual construction of the Mishkan, there's no mention much whatsoever of the function of the Mishkan for God to dwell amongst the people. And I submit that the reason it's missing is because Moshe doesn't know that he can promise that. From everything he's seen and heard from Hashem, it's not clear that the Shekhinah is going to once again dwell amongst the people. Similarly, when it comes to the Aron. Comes to the Aron, the, um, the um, function of the Aron was to be the place where the communication happens. Moshe builds the Aron, but mentions nothing of that. That Aron is only to serve the function of housing the Luchot. That's it. There are a number of other small details, but small details that, that are actually quite significant. Um, it, here's, here's one. Uh, the, um, in the construction of the Mishkan, there's one of the vessels is conspicuously out of place. Uh, when I say conspicuously out of place, it means it actually looks like it's an afterthought. Hashem told Moshe about all the inner kingdom all the inner vessels of the, uh, the Mishkan. Then he tells him about, um, about building the curtains and the walls. And then he tells him about the outer Mizbeach and the accoutrements of the outer Mizbeach. He tells him about the curtains that go around the courtyard. Then he talks about Big Day Kahuna and then about the inauguration of the Kohanim. And then finally, after all of that, he says, um, and all of this um, is to serve the purpose of my dwelling amongst the people. I think it's actually, it's actually worth our while, if we can bring this up, to actually take a look at the Psukim there. It's, it, it's quite powerful. Um, Parakaftet. The end of Parakaftet. Starting with, let's look at Pasuk Mem Gimel. Okay, so after all of that, we have Vino Adati Sham Perik Mem Gimel, but Pasuk Mem Gimel, sorry, Pasuk 43. Vino Adati Shama Livne Yisrael, Vinikdash Bichvodi. That is where I will meet Vine Yisrael. And it will be either it meaning the Mishkan or Bene Yisrael will be sanctified through my presence. I will sanctify the 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 Oed, I will sanctify the Mizbeach, Aaron, his sons, and then Pasuk 45, Memhei, Yisrael. This is the climax. This 
closes the entire story of the Mishkan. It starts with Yasuni Nikdash, Vishakanti Bitokham. It closes with Vishakanti Bitoch Bene Israel. I will dwell amongst them. And that will be the sign that the process that we started at Har Sinai, right? That I will be for them a God and they will be for me a people. Vayiti Vahem Elohim. And the closing pasuk of that section, they will know that I am their God. I took them out of Egypt in order so that I could dwell amongst them. Right? So here we see very clearly what this is the closing of the entire story of the, uh, of the Mishkan. And we see over here, you know, the, the relationship between Hashem and Am Yisrael. He took them out of Egypt, not like he says afterwards by Chayte Ego. This is the close. After this, everything up until this point is to bring the Shekhinah into the camp. And then we hear about, oh, by the way, there's one more Kli, one more of the vessels, it happens to be one of the internal ones. Um, and it apparently serves a different function than bringing the Shekhinah into the camp. And that is the Mezbeach HaKetoret. It appears in the Chumash almost as an afterthought. It's not an afterthought at all, but it's clear, and the Sfarno and others have pointed out, it's clear that the function of the Mizbeach HaKetoret is not to bring the Shekhinah into the camp. It serves a very different function. Okay, I'm not going to go into what that function is right now, but it's clear, and that's what, that's what the Chumash has done over here. It's, it has separated out the Mizbeach HaKetoret because the Mizbech HaKetoret does not serve the function of bringing the Shekhinah into the camp. Well, when Moshe tells the people to build the Mishkan, he doesn't separate the Mizbech HaKetoret out. He puts it together with all the other internal kingdom. Build this, build this, build this, put them together. You know, well, th there's no sense that... Um, that this Mishkan is actually going to work. Moshe is building this, the people follow through, they follow the instructions, they're afraid of messing up another time, like they messed up with the ego, but there's no sense that something very positive or very powerful is going to come from this. It's all very rote. In fact, the line that keeps coming up over and over and over again in Vayakhel and Bukhide, they do Kasher Tziva Hashem et Moshe, Kasher Tziva Hashem et Moshe. Dozens of times, Kasher Tziva Hashem et Moshe. I think it's actually 21 times if you, if, um, if, if, if you count them. It, it is the theme phrase of the construction of the Mishkan. And that's because they're following rules and they, they don't know what the function of the Mishkan is supposed to be. Because Moshe doesn't share with them what the function of the Mishkan is supposed to be because he doesn't know if that Mishkan is actually going to work. This adds a completely different sense of drama, by the way, to the inauguration of the Mishkan, which we hear about in Parashat Shmini. In the inauguration of the Mishkan, so we have the seven days of Miluim, where, um, where, uh, where Aaron and his sons are being installed as the Kohanim. And somewhere they're expecting that somewhere in those seven days of the Miluim, something is going to happen, is going to be some kind of sign from Hashem. And for seven days, that doesn't happen. When we get, when we get to the beginning of Perak Tet in Sefer Vayikra, Vayihi um, Bayom Hashmini, there was not supposed to be an eighth day. This Eighth day and a ceremony that happens on this eighth day is Moshe's invention. Hashem told Moshe about a seven day process. After seven days, nothing happened. So now Moshe's panicking. I need to do something. And Moshe invents a process that's unlike the process of the previous seven days. If you take, um, if you take a look at Pasuk Vav, Pasuk 6, you, you'll see what Moshe says over here. Vayomer Moshe, because right, he makes all of this stuff up, 
ויאמר משה, זה הדבר אשר ציווה השם תעשו. This is what you need to do. ויירא אליכם כבוד השם. And then God's appearance is going to appear. They were expecting that to happen on the first of the seven days or the last of the seven days. The Torah never mentioned an eighth thing before, and now nothing has happened. So Moshe says, okay, do this in order so that the presence of Hashem appears. The, the crisis that emerges is when they do all of that, and there's still no presence of Hashem. If, if you take a look at, at Pasuk Kaf Beit, in the same parak, so just beforehand, the last words there are, Karsher Tziva Moshe, and then Vayisa Aronik Yada, Baharom raises his hands, right, and goes to bless the people. He goes to bless the people. Vayered, and he comes down. He comes down from finishing everything and nothing happened. There's nothing going on. There's extraordinary drama in this moment. Is, is the Shekhinah going to join us or not? And that's when Moshe and Aaron together go back in to the Mishkan. Pasuk Kav Gimel. Vayavon Moshe v'yaharon el el ha-mo'ed. They go in together. And all the Mepharshim want to know what are they doing, why are they going in together, why are they going in, because nothing happened. Rashi says, he brings a Midrash that says, Moshe goes and pleads with Hashem and says, please, you know, don't embarrass Aaron this way. They went in. And then they came out. Then they come out together, they bless the people. And only then only then does, does the Shekhinah appear. Okay? There's, there's something very powerful about this. Uh, but what it highlights more than anything else is the sense of uncertainty. What's going to be? What I'd like to do uh, is I'd like to go back a little bit. I'd like to go back to this story is told to us in a different version. This story of Hashem appearing in the Mishkan is told to us in a different version at the end of Sefer Shmot. Literally the last five psukim of Sefer Shmot. So if we take a look at Perek Mem, Pasuk Lamed Dalid, After Moshe finishes everything, we had one version of it in Vayikra. Here's a different version of it in, uh, in the end of Shmot. There's actually a third version of this in Sefer B'mid Bar Sinai, which we're not going to focus on now. Um, but Pasuk Lamed Dalet 34, Vayichas Ha'anan at Ohel Mo'ed. The cloud covered over the Ohel Mo'ed, Uchvod Hashem Malayat Hamishka. So it looks like Hashem's presence has returned except that there seems to be a little bit of a hitch. And the hitch here is that Hashem's presence has returned, but the communication with Moshe has been broken. Pasuk 35 tells us, Moshe can't go into the Olam Oed anymore. It used to be at the Olam Oed where Moshe communicated with Hashem, but now that the presence of Hashem is there, so not only not only are B'nai Yisrael cut off from Hashem, the Shekhinah is here, but even Moshe is cut off from Hashem. Beforehand, the Anan on the Oho Moed was the invitation for Moshe to come in. But here, the Anan, the cloud on the Oho Moed, is actually telling Moshe to leave. And we're left with, with a sort of ambivalence as to what exactly is happening over here. The ambivalence of this moment takes a different form in Parashat Shmini because immediately after God's presence descended when Moshe and Aharon came out and blessed the people, well, that's when Aharon's two sons died. It's immediately afterwards, right? In fact, 
if you take a look, I thank you for being really quick on the, uh, I'm bringing up the Pesukim over here. Um, go back one Pasuk, go back to the, that's it, the last Pasuk of, that's good, okay? Take a look at Pasuk 24, Pasuk Chav Dalid, this is the sign, this is the sign from God that, that um, the Shekhinah is present. Hashem, a fire came out from Hashem, Vatochal, and it consumed on the Mizbeach all the things that needed to be consumed. If you take a look exactly two psukim later, exactly two psukim later, after Nadav and Avihu bring their ketoret, we have this uh, scroll up just, just one more line. I want to see Pasuk Kapdalid and Pasuk Beit. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Take a look at the first five words of, of Pasuk Kapdalid at the top of your screen and the first five words of Pasuk Beit towards the bottom of your screen. The same fire that consumes the Karbanot and the Mizbeach is the same fire that consumes Nadav Anavihu. Batochal Otam. Not what's on the Mizbeach. Thank you for the reminder. Okay. Um, this, this, is, um, this is the tragedy of the Shekhinah coming back in. This is what Hashem warned us about. Hashem warned Moshe that Shekhinah coming back in can be dangerous. Dangerous, communication is cut off, and people are going to die. Sefer Vayikra presents to us, I believe, the opening of Sefer Vayikra. And if we can open up to Perak Aleph, Pasuk Aleph of Sefer Vayikra. Sefer Vayikra, I believe, offers Hashem's reconstruction of how are we going to redo this. Remember, the end of Sefer Shemot, Moshe could not enter the Mishkan. He couldn't, he couldn't go into the Ohamo Eid. In Sefer Vayikra, Hashem invites him back into the Ohamo Eid. The opening line. This is the continuation of the end of Sefer Shemot. Vayikra el Moshe. Hashem calls to Moshe. Vayidaber Hashem elav mi Ohamo Eid. Hashem calls him back in. What we have here in the beginning of Sefer Vayikra is something that's extraordinary. If you were to take a look at Sefer Shemot, you would discover that there is only one carbon, one regular carbon in all of Sefer Shmot. With everything having to do with the construction of the Mishkan, there is a single carbon. It is the carbon tamid that's brought twice a day. It is a communal offering. It is a public offering. That means that when Hashem conceived of the Mishkan and taught it to Moshe, the idea was going to be that there was only going to be a daily offering by the community, by the tzibur, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. God's relationship is with the people as a whole, with the nation as a whole. Chet Egel shattered that. So God says, I'll rebuild my relationship through Moshe. But now that the Mishkan is there and Moshe insists on that Mishkan, it's going to be problematic. So Hashem says, you know what? Let's do this differently. My relationship with the people is no longer going to be with the nation as a whole. My relationship with the people is going to be contingent on my relationship with individuals. When individuals in Am Yisrael reached out to me, when individuals in Am Yisrael, when enough individuals in Am Yisrael build their relationships with me, then I can have a relationship with the corporate identity of, of Am Yisrael. And that's why the opening of Sefer Bayikra is all about individual korbanot. There are no public korbanot over here. There's a chatat, there's an ola, there's a shlamim, there's a mincha, there's an asham. Every one of the different kinds of karbanot, but it's ish, adam. Pasuk beit, da'beral b'nei Yisrael v'martalehem, adam. 
every individual now has a responsibility to establish a relationship with God. It is no longer a corporate thing. It is now an individual thing. The nature of our covenant with Hashem has been transformed. If as a community we're going to have a covenant with Hashem, it's only going to be because many, many individuals have chosen to have that covenant with Hashem. And then the covenant, the brit with Hashem, on, on a larger scale, can actually be, uh, be expressed. With this, I want to come full circle to what we started with. Parashat Pinchas. Parashat Pinchas tells us about the Karbanot of the Chagim. It starts with the Karban Hatamid, which is the only Karban mentioned in Sefer Shmot. And in fact, we're not going to do this right now, but you can take a look at the Korban Tamid, the section of the Korban Tamid that's listed in um, the end of Parashat Tetzavim and compare it to the Parashat of Korban Tamid that appears in Sefer, in Sefer Bamidbar Sinai, in, in Bamidbar Perak Pet, and you will see that the two Parashiyot are nearly identical. I believe there's a single letter that's different. A single letter, right? Um, the, 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 the psukim are, are essentially, it, it, it's the same, um, it, it's the same parsha. okay? Um, uh, so here we have, we, we can take out the, the comparison now because that's, that's not as relevant. And I start with the question of why are these carbonotes here? And what I'm going to suggest is that these carbonotes represent the possibility for a renewal of a direct relationship between the corporate entity of Am Yisrael and Hashem. And why are they here? They're here because of what comes right before this. We go to the end of Perak Kav Zayin. The end of Perak Kav Zayin A, a, a little bit further up, a little bit further up, Hashem tells Moshe, it's time for you to die. And Moshe refuses. He says, no. Uh, let, let, let's, let's go down, uh, yeah, right, right over here. Pasuk Yud Beit, Hashem tells Moshe, Alei al har ha'avarim hazeh, ra'e et ha'aretz ha'shenatati l'vnei Yisrael, ra'e tota, you're going to see the land, v'nei ha'saftala mecha, you're going to die. Pasuk Tetva, which now appears on your screen, is an extraordinary pasuk. It sounds like lots of psukim that we are familiar with, but it's inverted. We're used to reading Vayidaber Hashem Moshe Leimor. For once in the Torah, we have the reverse. Vayidaber Moshe El Hashem Leimor. This is the language of command. Moshe commands Hashem. And Moshe says, I'm not ready to die. There's something that you have an obligation to do first. What does Moshe demand of Hashem? Moshe demands of Hashem that Hashem appoint a leader to take his place. Okay, Hashem tells him, Yoshua, whatever it is. Aside from, from the extraordinary leadership that Moshe, that Moshe displays here, one of the things that I suspect is, um, is lurking underneath Moshe's fear of dying is that ever since Chet HaEgel, God's relationship with Am Yisrael has been mediated through Moshe. We saw that earlier. We saw God tells Moshe, I'm going to establish a brief with you. Um, we saw that, uh, that I'm going to make miracles for your people, not my people, but your people. Um, one of the things we didn't see as much, um, Moshe comes down the, ma the mountain and his face radiates. Um, God has a relationship with Moshe. Moshe has a relationship with people, but there's no direct relationship between God and the people. Everything happens through Moshe. And the more you look in the psukim there, 
At the end of Parashat Kitisa, the more you're going to see of that. Which means that the, the breach between Hashem and B'nai Yisrael doesn't exist without Moshe's direct intervention. And that's what, yes, thank you. And that's why Moshe turns to Hashem and says, I cannot die until I have a guarantee that there is going to be a continuation to this covenant between you and the people that does not involve me. So Hashem tells him, I want you to bring Yoshua here. And after Yoshua is installed as the leader, what's the very first thing the Torah does? The Torah goes and says, remember the parsha when we were first building the Mishkan? Remember the parsha when I first told you about the Mishkan? Well, the, the, um, the, the section that came immediately before that climax, the penultimate section was about the Korban Tamid. The Korban Tamid is what describes the ongoing relationship that Hashem has with the corporate identity of Am Yisrael. Guess what? I'm bringing that back. Moshe, you can rest in peace. You don't need to be there for that to happen. So not only am I going to appoint a leader in your stead, but I'm going to restore that. And not only am I going to restore that, I'm going to expand that. It's not just the Tamidim, but now we're going to expand that into the Musafim. You have the Musaf of, Shab- of Rosh Chodesh, you have the Musaf of Shabbat, you have the most Musafim for every one of the Chadim. That is going to now be the symbol of the ongoing and the renewing relationship. The Tamidim is the ongoing, it's the daily, the Musaf is the renewing. The ongoing and the renewing relationship, Moshe, you can rest. If I have one minute, I just want to put this into, into a context. We are here two and a half weeks before Rosh Hashanah. We have an opportunity for, um, for a corporate, as a nation, um, a relationship with Hashem. But we also have opportunities for individual relationship with God, not just as a community. And that's the beginning of Sefer Vayikra. Every one of us, as we go into our Abu Dhabi, on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Kippur, and in the lead up to those Yamim, literally Noraim, um, we have a framework that the Torah provides for us for what it means to have a, a relationship with Hashem on an individual level, on a national level, on a communal level. And we also have a picture in front of us of the terror of losing that. So I just want to wish for all of us that as we go into these Yamim Hanorahim, that we set ourselves goals in renewing, um, renewing and refreshing, both on a personal level and on a national level, our relationship with Hashem. And hopefully, we will, both as individuals, as communities, and as a nation, experience that sense of Kvod Hashem Malay et Habayit. I want to wish everybody a Shana Tovah.